This morning, my, my mission is to speak on what is considered one of the most difficult topics. If you ask pastors what, what is their least favorite topic to speak on, many of them would mention the topic that I'm speaking on today. If you ask church members what is their least favorite topic to hear, many would respond with the exact same topic that I am speaking on today. So whenever we mention the topic, many pastors cringe, and quite frankly, many church members flinch whenever the topic is mentioned. And so I decided, let's just get it out there right away. I'm going to mention the topic, and I'm going to cringe, and I will give you the opportunity to flinch when I say it this morning, okay? All right, this morning, very simply, we are speaking on giving, and we're talking about what does the Bible say about giving. There you go. We got it over with. That wasn't that bad, was it? I didn't see too many people flinch that much. Now, I know all of the criticisms. From the pastor's point of view, pastors would sit back and say, Pastor Brian, church members don't give enough. I've heard all of the criticisms. I've heard the criticisms from church members as well that say, preachers mention it too often. If preachers wouldn't mention it that often, then maybe we would give more. Quite frankly, we strive not to mention it that often. It's been a year and a half since we have spoken on the topic. It's a difficult topic, I admit. Uh, some of you may remember the comedian Flip Wilson. Does anybody remember Flip Wilson? The comedian, we're dating ourselves just a little bit, but remember the comedian Flip Wilson. One of the characters that Flip Wilson used to play in his skits was a pastor that pastored the What's Happening Now Church. You may remember that. And in, uh, in one of those skits, the pastor was standing up preaching. The pastor was standing up yelling, and the pastor said this. He said, if this church is going to serve God, it's got to get down on its knees and crawl. The audience then was then prompted as the congregation, and the audience responded back, make it crawl, preacher, make it crawl. He then would say, once this church has learned to crawl, it's got to get up on its feet and walk. Once again, the audience participated, and the audience yelled back, Make it walk, preacher! Make it walk! And then he would say, Once the church has learned to walk, it's got to begin to run. And you know how the congregation responded. They yelled out, Make it run, preacher! Make it run! And then he would say, now, in order for the church to reach deep and, uh, and run and be all that God wants it to be, we've got to dig down deep into our pockets and give. And there was a silence over the whole congregation. And all of a sudden, somebody yelled out, Make it crawl, Pastor! Make it crawl! <laughs> Let's admit it, giving is a touchy topic. Nevertheless, it's a biblical one. Uh, you might not know this, but the Bible speaks more on the subject of finances, generosity, giving than on almost any other matter. Here's an example. Prayer is mentioned 289 times in the New Testament. All of us would agree prayer is important. Amen? Love is mentioned 363 times in the New Testament. All of us would agree, love is important. Giving or generosity is mentioned more than a thousand times in the New Testament. Quite frankly, though, giving is, is not a topic that should make us afraid. To the contrary, God never asks us to give anything. God never asks us to do anything for that matter that he will not supply. I'm reminded of what Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5.24, He who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. Whatever God asks you to do, God will provide that which is necessary for you to do it. If God asks you to share your faith, he'll give you the courage to stand up and share your faith. 
If God asks you to be involved in ministry, whether it's teaching or even preaching, God will give you the ability to do that. And if God asks you to give, God will provide. He has promised that he will provide. Now the age-old question that everyone debates is this, how much should I give? How much should every believer give? Well, well, you know as well as I do, the Old Testament pattern is 10%. It was a matter of fact, it was a part of the law. The children of Israel were required to give the first 10%, not the last 10%, but the first 10% of, of everything they made. They were required to give that to the Lord. Many say, Brian, hey, the New Testament pattern, though, is different. The New Testament pattern is based upon love. It's based upon a relationship. It's based upon dependence on God. I heard of a well-known speaker that was speaking on giving, and he mentioned the tithe. As a matter of fact, on a Sunday morning, he stood up and he, and he outlined the biblical mandate, mandate that's laid out in the Old Testament on the tithe. And after the conclusion of the service, there was some uproar, there was some discussion, and there was some criticism. And so the following week, the, the pastor came back and he addressed the congregation. And the first thing he said was, I am so sorry. I gave you the wrong figure. I gave you the wrong number. After further study, I realized that the number I gave you was wrong. Last week, I said that God wants us to give 10%. That is not true. Take out your pens. Let me give you the new number. Here's the new number that belongs to God. And he said the new number is 100%. You see, quite frankly, everything we have comes from God. James said it this way, every good and every perfect gift comes down from above. The simple fact is that we owe everything that we have. We owe everything that we are to him. That truth is clearly seen in the passage that we're studying today. And so grab your Bibles with me, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. I'm going to read the first 11 verses. This morning, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. Paul says this, Now I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, what God in his kindness has done through the churches in Macedonia. They are being tested by many troubles, and they are very poor, but they are also filled with abundant joy, which is overflowed in rich generosity. Verse 3, For I can testify that they gave not only what they could afford, but far more. And they did it of their own free will. They begged us again and again for the privilege of sharing in the gift for the believers in Jerusalem. Now Paul is talking about a specific gift, a specific offering that was being raised for believers in Jerusalem that were struggling. And the Corinthian believers had made a commitment that they were going to, going to give. Verse 4 says they begged us again and again. For the privilege of sharing in the gift for the believers in Jerusalem, they even did more than we had hoped. For their first action was to give themselves to the Lord. If you underline in your Bibles, that's a great phrase to underline. Their first action was to give themselves to the Lord. And to us, just as God wanted them to do. So we have urged Titus, who encouraged your giving in the first place, to return to you and encourage you to finish this ministry of giving. Since you excel in so many ways in your faith, your gifted speakers, your knowledge, your enthusiasm, and your love from us, I want you to excel also in this gracious act of giving. I'm not commanding you to do this, but I am testing how genuine your love is by comparing it with the eagerness of other churches. You know the generous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ Though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. So by his poverty, he could make you rich. Here's my advice. It would be good for you to finish what you started a year ago. Paul says, it would be good for you to give. Last year, you were the first who wanted to give, and you were the first to begin doing it. Now you should finish what you started. Let the eagerness you showed at the beginning be matched now by your giving. Give in proportion to what you have. Let's pray together. 
Father, we thank you so much for uh, everything that we've been able to experience in this service. Lord, I rejoice in, in two families, seven new believers that have followed you in believer's baptism. Father, we look forward in just a few moments to, to celebrating the Lord's Supper and, and remembering what you did for us. Now, Lord, for just a few moments, I pray that you'd help us to understand the truth of your word. Help us to understand that which Paul was exhorting the Corinthians to do and how that applies to each and every one of us. Father, I pray you'd help us to have faith. I pray that you'd help us to, to use the gifts that you've given us, but help us also to be faithful in our giving. And so we thank you for what you're going to teach us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning we're finishing up a four-week series that we have simply titled Connecting the Dots. The idea being that, that there are biblical truths that we hear, but quite frankly, often we don't apply. I sat back and we talked as the staff, how different would the church be if we connected the dots? How different would Hollywood Community Church be if we actually did what the Bible exhorts us to do? We've looked at three topics already. Let me just give them to you briefly. First of all, we saw that we should not just be a hearer of the word, but also a doer. Brad brought that message out of James chapter 1. It's not sufficient to hear God's word if we don't actually put it into practice. In the second message, we saw that one of the evidences of Holy Spirit control is how we relate to one another. We looked at Ephesians chapter 15, and we saw that command, be controlled by the Holy Spirit of God, and we saw that, uh, how that related to our relationships, husband and wives, and parents with kids, and employers and employees. Here's what Paul said, if you're out of sync with others, you're out of sync with God. Our relationships demonstrate our relationship with God. Last week we saw this. Our love for Jesus should motivate us to be involved in Christian service. And that which motivates us to serve, whether it's in the local body or, or in the community, that which motivates us to serve is not necessarily the need, even though the need is great. What motivates us to serve is our love for Jesus Christ. And we serve Jesus Christ by serving others. Remember the Lord asked Peter three different times, Peter, do you love me? Peter said, Lord, yes, I love you. And the Lord said, okay, then feed my sheep. Serve my body. Minister to others. Well, in this message today, we see that our giving is not motivated, nor it is dependent in a very real sense upon what we have, but our giving is motivated by our love for Jesus Christ, and our giving is motivated by the examples that he has given us in Scripture. So, so dig in with me this morning. I'm going to go a little fast. We're a little short on time, and so let's, let's see what the Apostle Paul challenged, or how he challenged the Corinthians, and how he challenges us as well. The first point is this. You are motivated to give by biblical examples. All of us learn by example. As guys, we learn to shave, how? By, by watching our dads shave. Uh, ladies, or girls, learn to be ladies by observing the action and the mannerisms of their mothers. Young athletes observe and learn from watching older athletes participate. Here's what Paul is saying. He challenges the Corinthians and us to give, and he says, let me challenge you by giving you two wonderful examples, two examples that we should follow. The first example that he gives are the churches in Macedonia. Paul says that you and I should follow the example of the churches of Macedonia. Notice verse 1, once again, Now I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, what God and his kindness has done through the churches in Macedonia. Where, where were these churches? 
Well, Macedonia is located in Asia Minor. I think I have a, a map that you can see up on the screen. Present day Macedonia is located in the Balkan Peninsula. This is the area of Albania and Greece. And, and when Paul talks about the Macedonian churches, we can go back and look at several New Testament examples and, and we realize exactly what churches the Apostle Paul was, was speaking of. First of all, I believe he was speaking of the church of Philippi. Can we put the map back up, guys, so everybody can see? The church of, of Philippi. In Philippians chapter 4 and verse 15, Paul commended them. He said, you were the only ones who gave me financial help. And so in spite of their poverty, as we'll see in a moment, the church of Philippi faithfully gave to the work of God. The other example, I believe, is the church of Thessalonica. Uh, Thessalonica, uh, there you can see Thessalonica as well. In 1 Thessalonians 1, 7 and 8, Paul says, You became an example to the believers in Greece and throughout all of Macedonia. So what was it about these two churches that makes the Apostle Paul lift them up as an example to us? Obviously, different day and age different culture, a different customs. What is it that made them stand out as an example to us? Let me give you four characteristics of this church. First of all, they were devoted. These people were devoted. We see that they were so devoted to the fellowship of the ministry of the saints, of meeting the needs of the believers in Jerusalem, that their devotion prevailed in spite of two obstacles. If you study these verses, it says that they were generous in spite of the fact that they had many troubles and that they were experiencing poverty. Now, now don't miss the paradox that's offered in these verses. Their affliction and their poverty abounded unto their liberality. Their generosity. That seemingly wouldn't make sense. You'd think that somebody was, that was experiencing persecution and trouble and uh, a person that was poor wouldn't be so liberal in their giving. Yeah, that's not what Paul says about these two churches. Even though they were experiencing poverty, they were very generous in what they gave. Well, that reminds me so much of what we just experienced in, in Haiti just a few weeks ago. The Haitian believers in Karai do not allow their struggles nor their poverty to affect their relationship with God. Get this, many of them walk to church. Not just a couple of blocks around the corner, many of them walk miles to church. If you had to walk to church, would you come? They sat through the entire service, get this, with no air conditioning whatsoever. Now that's dedication. Now you saw me. I had fans blowing on me during the service. I couldn't handle it. They could. Man, they are devoted. They don't let the difficulties of their circumstances keep them from doing what God wants them to do. And how often do we allow our circumstances to deter us to keep us from doing and being what God wants us to do. They were devoted. The second thing we see is that they were dependent. Verse 3, Paul says, For I can testify that they gave not only what they could afford, but far more. In other words, they depended on God to provide so that they might give. The third thing I say about them is this. They were determined. Notice what Paul says about them. Paul says, they begged us again and again for the privilege of sharing in the gift. Now, I can only imagine how the conversation went, but Paul, something along these lines, listen, man, I know you guys are struggling. I know that you're going through all kinds of troubles, and man, you might not even have, uh, you know, two quarters to rub together. Don't feel obligated to participate. And Paul says, yet their response was, no, Paul, we want to. Please give us the privilege of being involved. They were devoted, they were dependent, and they were determined. They were determined not to let their situation suffocate their sincerity. Paul says, 
I lift them up as an example to you. Now, there's one further characteristic of the Macedonian believers that really sets them apart, but I'd like to return to that at the end of the chapter. So leave that space blank, and we'll fill that out in just a few moments. The first example that Paul gives, though, are the Macedonian churches. The second example that he gives is so much greater. He gives the example of Jesus Christ. Notice verse eight once again, or verse nine. For you know the generous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that we through his poverty might become rich. Man, the greatest giver of all time is none other than Jesus Christ himself. Man, you talk about under-exaggeration. Though he was rich. Think with me, for all of eternity, there was Jesus in heaven, surrounded by unbelievable wealth, surrounded by unbelievable praise. And Jesus chose to give that up and come to earth. Though he was rich, Yet for your sakes, he became poor. The word poor that's used in that verse is a very interesting verse. There's several verses in the New Testament that are translated uh, poor or poverty. One is, a, one is a temporary poverty. Parents, we know what that's like. Kids come and say, hey, Dad, can I have 10 bucks? And, you know, we're able to pull out our pockets and say, I'm sorry, I don't have anything to give you. Now, it doesn't mean there's no money in the bank. We just don't have any money on us at that moment, I remember years ago, Justin or Mark, I don't remember which one it was, came and they wanted money for something, and I used the age old, hey, I'm sorry, I don't have any cash on me. And at a little age, they look at me and say, come on, Dad, don't you have a credit card? <laughs> Kids learn early, all right? Temporary poverty. That's not the word that's used describing Jesus. The word that Paul uses means absolute, beggarly, poverty. Though Jesus was unbelievably rich, he became unbelievably poor. He gave up everything for you and me. There's a purpose clause in the passage. It says, so that. The idea being Jesus did all of that for a purpose so that we, through his poverty, might become rich. Please do not interpret this verse uh, as, as if Paul was teaching prosperity theology. He's not. He's talking about the wealth that comes as being a believer in Jesus Christ, in all that we inherit. So, so here's what Paul says. You and I are motivated to give by biblical examples. There's a second thing that we see in the passage. You and I are enabled to give by grace. We're enabled to give by grace. In this passage, Paul uses nine different words to describe giving. Verse 2, he uses the word generosity. In verse 4, he uses the word gift. In verse 6, he talks about the ministry of giving. He uses nine different words, but the most frequent word that Paul uses in this passage describing giving is not a word that I would have imagined. He uses the word grace, and he talks about giving as being a demonstration of grace. Notice in verse 7, he speaks of the gracious act of giving. In verse 9, he talks about generous grace. So, so here's what Paul is saying. Paul is saying that the ability to give generously, to, to give to God what God expects and what God desires for us to give him is a grace. It, it's something that God gives to us. Let me tell you a couple of things about grace. Grace is this. Grace is God-given and unearned. The nature of grace is that God gives us what we do not and cannot ever deserve or earn ourselves. We're saved by grace. We're empowered by grace. We're strengthened by grace. Everything that God does in our lives is by and through grace. Can I get an amen this morning? Grace simply means God giving us what we do not deserve. 
So here Paul says that this ability to give generously is a grace. It's something that God gives to us. You'll notice in the passage as well that the grace of giving is placed on the same level as faith, gifted speaking, and knowledge. He says that uh, in verse 7, since you excel in many ways in your faith, your gifted speakers, your knowledge, your enthusiasm, and your love for us, I want you to excel in this gracious act of giving as well. And we would readily admit that faith and knowledge are God-given abilities. That's a powerful grace. But giving is as well. So here's the third thing if you're following along. God gives us then the grace or the ability to give. God gives us the grace or the ability to give. Such a grace is not dependent upon how much I have, how much I make. It's dependent upon God's ability to provide. That's why Jesus says in Luke chapter 6 and verse 38, Give and you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full. Here's what Jesus is saying and what Paul is saying. Paul is saying this, He's saying that God is the supply, and we are nothing more than the channel through which God accomplishes his ministry. So I believe with all of my heart that God is looking for people who are willing to be gracious givers. And as we give graciously, as we give generously, God supplies so that we might give more. Paul says this, generous giving is a grace. It's something that God enables us to do. Notice the third thing in your outlines. The third thing is this. You are exhorted to give in two ways. In verse 8, I find it interesting. Paul tells the Corinthians, he says, I'm not commanding you to do this, but I am testing how genuine your love is by comparing it with the eagerness of of other churches. Two thoughts that I wrote down about this. The first is this, you and I should give willingly. We should give willingly. What does that mean? It means the pastor shouldn't have to twist our arms to give. It means that, you know, no one should have to beg you or exhort you or, or uh, punish you or, or push you. It's something that you and I should do willingly. Why is that? Because we're following the example of Jesus. Jesus loved so much that he did what? He gave. And so our attitude, our response in giving is not something that should be forced. It is something that should be done willingly. Notice in chapter 9 and verse 7 what the Apostle Paul says. Just in the, in the next chapter, Paul says this, You must each decide in your heart how much to give, and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure, for God loves a person that gives cheerfully. Yeah, you know the word uh, cheerfully there actually has the idea of giddiness. He's saying God loves the person who gives with laughter, with emotion, who is thrilled to give back to God. The idea is this, you should give willingly. But Paul makes a second statement, you should also also give worshipfully. Notice Paul says, I am testing how genuine your love is. And once again, he's talking about their love for whom? Their love for God. We say often, you hear me say, and, 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 and obviously the, the offering part of the service is not something we do just to pay the bills. And, and you hear me say something on a regular basis that this is a demonstration of worship. And giving is as much worship as singing the worship songs or serving. Giving is a worship experience. It most certainly was in the Old Testament as they brought those, those, those tithes, they brought those lambs, and they brought those turtle doves, and they brought those animals, and they gave them to God, and they sacrificed those animals on the altar as they gave their gifts to the Lord. It was what? It was an act of worship for them. 
So every time you and I have the privilege to give to God, it is what? It is a demonstration of worship. Paul says, I'm testing the sincerity of your love. Let me show you the fourth thing. I know I've raced through this this morning. But the fourth thing in the passage is this. You and I are encouraged to give and to reap the benefits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I said that correctly. We're encouraged to give and to reap the benefits. Notice verse 10. Here's what Paul says. And here is my advice. It would be good for you to finish what you started a year ago. We'll go back. The, the, the word advice there literally means, or when he says it's good for you, he literally means this is advantageous for you. Now, that's an easy one for us to understand. A couple of things. First of all, giving is advantageous to God's kingdom. We understand that. And yet it's so very important. God has chosen to use us for the advancement of his kingdom. You know, God could have chosen a lot of different ways to, to fulfill his work. He could have, you know, every month send an email to Hollywood Community Church and say, okay, if you guys will go to this and this address and you'll dig real deep, you'll hit oil. <laughs> or if you go to this place right here, you're going to find gold. God could have chosen to finance his work that way, but that's not the way he's chosen. God has chosen to finance his work through the giving of God's and every time that you and I give, we're involved in advancing the work of God. Your giving facilitates and finances the preaching of the gospel both here and abroad. When I wrote that this week, I had no idea that Rudy and Lorraine were going to be here this morning. Uh, they're on the mission field because we give sacrificially to them. And their support comes out of your giving we send money to missionaries all around the world. Your giving is advantageous to the kingdom of God. But Paul says something else. Paul says giving is advantageous to you. It not only benefits God's kingdom, but it benefits you as well. Notice what he says, verse 10. Here is my advice. It would be good for you. The New King James says it this way. It is to your advantage the old king james says it is expedient for you paul says listen this is for your benefit it's not just for the benefit of god's work but it's for your benefit as well you see your giving not only helps god's work and helps the church advance but it helps you let me give you just a couple of ways and i'm almost done First of all, generous giving develops an unselfish attitude. We live in a day and age in which it's all about us. Generous giving develops an unselfish attitude. Acts 20, 35 says, and you'd remember the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. Generous giving allows you to participate in the work of of God. Paul commended the Philippians saying, man, when you gave, that was a blessing, not because I wanted a gift, but I wanted fruit that would abound to your accounts. And generous giving guarantees that God will meet all of your needs. Often we quote, quote Philippians 4.19, but my God will supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. And we quote that as if that was generically given to every believer. That promise is given to the Philippians because they gave sacrificially and they gave generously. And as a result, God promised to meet each and every one of their needs. Before we close today, we skipped a point. Clear back in the beginning, we talked about the Macedonians, that they were able to give so generously for four reasons. First of all, they were devoted. They were dependent and they were determined. How could somebody who's experiencing deep poverty be so devoted, dependent, and determined? How could somebody who's experiencing persecution be so devoted, dependent, and determined that they wanted to be involved in the work of God? The answer is found in verse 5. Would you look back at verse 5 with me? Verse 5 simply says this. They even did more than we had hoped, 
for their first action was to give themselves to the Lord. You see, they were dedicated. They realized that, that, that God doesn't necessarily need my money as much as God needs me. And church, God doesn't need your money or my money as much as he needs us. Quite frankly, many believers don't give as they should because they've never, first of all, given themselves to God. There's a lot in their life that they are holding 